evening, good morning, and I have the best news in the world for you. You are, each and every one of you are now on worship team. And I don't even mind if you run up on stage and start singing. <laughs> I have a little bit of a cold, so forgive the, you know, if I don't quite reach all the other notes, I have a team of 20 who will do that. <laughs> Amen. So welcome, welcome. And let's just go ahead and speak to the Lord before we begin. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. We didn't just come to church, but you drew us together. I pray, Lord God, that our hearts would be open to whatever you have to say. Speak to us, Lord. Our hearts and our minds are turned and attentive to you. I pray, Lord God, that we would leave differently than the way we came in, even more so transformed into the image of your dear son. Lord, whatever issues are brought in, you see. We ask, Lord God, to do what you do to walk among your people, to heal, to save, to deliver. I pray that with every song that we sing, Lord God, that you would be glorified, that you would hear and that you would be pleased. So we just turn this morning over to you, and we thank you for your good spirit and your good life and your light. Amen. And those who are online, yay, hello. To my friends in the UK, hi.
sit down why don't you greet someone don't greet me I have cooties
So you're going to come up. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks for being in the room with us today. We have got uh, so many people that are uh, down with uh, one thing or another, lots of upper respiratory things, so I'm glad that you uh, were able to be here today. Those joining us online, whether you are well or, uh, uh, or ill, we're praying for you today. We're glad that you're joining us online. Uh, uh, my name is Brian. I'm one of the leaders here at Raleigh Vineyard. And uh, I want to share just a couple things with you as quickly as possible and then get out of the way. Uh, we've got some, uh, some things, though, that uh, are good to know. Uh, so first thing is tonight we have a group uh, meeting here tonight starting at 6 o'clock until about 8 o'clock. We are doing part one of the lost world of Genesis 1. If you've ever had any questions about uh, how do we reconcile the things we've learned in school and in and, and science and in history with the things that we read in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, we're trying to make sense of those things. Come out tonight. Uh, we're going to be uh, using a seminary now course to be able to uh, uh, dig into this and have this conversation. So that's tonight at 6. Uh, and it's going to be back in the uh, back of the hallway back here. Uh, second thing is, I have a need for some hospitality. Uh, if you would be willing to show some radical hospita hospitality, uh, not this week, but the following week, April 15, 16, and 17, I've got some pastor friends coming into Raleigh for a conference. And uh, some of them I've managed to already find. Uh, uh, people have, uh, the colleges have volunteered to take some. But I've got two people who are not a couple, but are coming together. So I need two beds, hopefully in one place, because they're only driving one car uh, all the way from Tennessee. And so if you would be, uh, no, sorry, that's not right, all the way from Ohio. And so if you would be uh, able to take two people and you have two beds uh, and you live somewhere in the Raleigh area, uh, that would be uh, super helpful. Uh, if you could see me today, let me know that you would be happy to have them stay at your place. I promise you they're not as messy as normal pastors. They will be very neat and tidy, and you'll hardly know that they were there. Now, my friend Glenn is going to come, and he's going to take a whole minute here, and he's going to give us an update on uh, Belarus Day and what's happening. Thanks. Uh, Belarusian Day was yesterday. It was awesome. Did great. Um, in fact, the extra snacks on, on the table were leftovers from the bake sale. I uh, want to thank all the vendors that, that rented booths, um, the guests that came, um, and, and back uh, a few months ago, the t-shirts uh, we sold, the fudge we sold, and of course all the donations that have come in for uh, uh, Hope for Belarus. Um, and the Boston Butts, amazing, I got ours. If you didn't pick yours up at the um, event yesterday, we have them here in the kitchens. Please stop by. Pam will be handing them out to whoever didn't pick them up. If you don't pick them up, I'm eating it because I they're amazing. Anyway, uh, yesterday we, we managed to raise in excess of $24,000. So that means uh, we are fully funded to transport all the kids to the United States. Um, in addition, um, so the translators that come, we have two translators slash um, accompanying people who will... Uh, who, who stop their jobs for six weeks to come, so we actually give them a salary when they come. But uh, appreciate all the help. Thank you very much. Awesome, awesome. That's brilliant. Uh, and now, uh, and this is not, uh, uh, not least by any means, but uh, now before Grant comes uh, to tell us some things, uh, Elisha and Rachel are getting ready to go back uh, to India and uh, ask them if they'd come up and let us pray for them today and uh, also give uh, Rachel has just always wanted a chance to speak <laughs> extemporaneously for several minutes uh, so we're going to ask uh, no she she definitely will kill me if I try that 
uh, but uh, I will give uh, either of them the microphone uh, just to uh, just remind us all where you're going, what you're going to be doing, how we can pray for you. Yeah, uh, so we're going to the north of India uh, for uh, two weeks, and uh, we're going to be serving uh, maybe about 200 kids at different places who are getting education for the first time, uh, that they've never been allowed to have education because they live in the poor class. And uh, we're bringing clean water to thousands of villagers, and we're going to like pray over the new wells that, are, uh, that we've sponsored. And um, also we're going to see the ladies who are uh, training for a skill to be able to start their own business with sewing. And then we're going to pray for the pastors and the leaders, and they're going to pray for us and share testimonies. So, and uh, we'll be back around the beginning of May. So Awesome. All right. And so we'll get some pictures and stories then? Yes. All right. Uh, could everybody just reach out a hand towards Rachel and Elisha? Let's pray a uh, blessing on them. Father, we thank you so much for Rachel and Elisha. We thank you that the uh, calling of God is on their lives to be able to go and and to uh, minister across cultures in different places, and that you have put this in their heart so that it's a joy for them to do, uh, even though it is sometimes taxing and sometimes a very uh, hard to do, uh, it's something that gives them joy. And so, God, we pray you'll multiply their joy in in these next two weeks uh, in India. We pray that they would see incredible ways that you're moving in people's lives. We pray that you would empower them by your Holy Spirit to have everything they need at just the right time with each person that they're ministering to, each group that they're with. Uh, God, we pray that they would experience your supernatural presence uh, working powerfully inside of their bodies to keep them well and to give them the energy they need, um, but also, God, to move, to, to give them something for each person that they encounter to be able to share with them uh, the good news of the kingdom coming. And we just love them when we ask your blessing on them now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now Mr. Grant is going to come. Pastor Grant's going to tell us exciting things we ought to know. A couple more exciting things. Good morning, y'all. Um, but yeah, I did just want to share in some good news. I wanted to thank you. We have a group of 20 of us going to camp in June, and we're super excited. Uh, but I also got the report for your generosity and, and what God's putting together, and we're, and we're really excited about just the ability to make a way for people that it might have been a big challenge. So truthfully, we we did have a need for some full-ride scholarships, and we have gotten those. And I, I just wanted to say thank you very much. Um, we'll continue to, to work through that till June. We don't actually go till June, so there's still time. But thank you so much for your partnership. Um, at this time, I do want to welcome, if you're in middle school and would like to join us, I'll meet you at those back double doors we are still working through the book of 1 Corinthians and excited about that this morning. And also, if you are not getting our emails or information coming your way, please let me know and I'll get all that stuff to you so you have the schedule and everything that we have coming up. But thank you so much. Uh, we are also... Um, uh, uh, let's see, how do I want to say this? So I will tell you that we are making some changes this morning uh, because uh, the Shock family got some uh, very sad news that Robin's father uh, passed away this morning. And that's Pastor Mary's grandfather. And so, so we're moving some things around with the kids. So if you have elementary kids, they're going to go... If you want them to go into a group, they're going to go in Miss Sandra's class, which is just uh, out here and to the right, uh, or they can stay in here with you. That's fine too, uh, but we're uh, we're just uh, having to uh, make that change last minute. Pastor uh, Eva is going to come and she's going to uh, pray for uh, the Shock family and pray for all of us uh, right now. <laughs> Miss Eva's looking around. Who is Pastor Mary? <laughs> or who's Pastor Eva? Has anybody here ever been pastored by Eva? Yes. Um, 
Thank you, guys. You know what? I really love you guys. I honestly mean that. Oh, Father, it's with sadness in our hearts that we pray for Mary's grandfather and, Mar and Robin's dad, Father. But you know what? On the bright side, he lived a good, long life. And you said in Psalms 91 that with long life, you will satisfy us. And I pray, Father God, that he's satisfied this morning. So let us pray. God, most precious Jesus, Holy, Holy Spirit, in Matthew 6, you tell us, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. He means it when he says everything. If you do that, beloved ones, he says, I will encourage you and strengthen you in all your love. The rest I will give you will be amazing. And I am going to do that now. All you have to do is receive it. And we receive it, Father, especially for Robin's mom, dad right now. We receive it, Lord. Thank you for empowering us for the tomorrows. I'm, I'm emotional because we've been praying for Robin's dad for a while. And knowing that he's with you now, Lord, it's just overwhelming but a glad thing. You call us all by your, our, our, our names, and you said that we are your own. I am the flame, you said, that burn within all of you, keeping your love strong and passionate towards me. You can do nothing in your strength, but it is I, Jesus says, will strengthen you. Nothing will diminish my love for any one of you. And we take that to heart, Father, because we believe it. You asking us to seek you, and we will find you. We need to know exactly how to do that, Father. So show us as the days go by, as the minutes go by, as the hours go by. Show us how to find you. I know, Father, that you're here with open arms waiting for all of us today. Just to come, come as you are. You don't have to have any shells. You don't have to have any mask. You don't have to have any of those. Just come, come to him and he will touch you. And he said it and when he says it, he means it. Now, Jesus, I know it is your heart's desire to bless Robin and her family and Pastor Brian and his family, and all of us sitting here this morning. You want to bless us in ways that people will notice and ask, and we'll be able to say it's because of God, it's because of Jesus, and because of the Holy Spirit, that we are the way we are. And we want so much, Father, to enter the world with joy and to light in you. So thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love and we thank you in advance. And we thank you for the peace that you're going to give Robin and her family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss Eva. Well, good morning again. I am going to uh, share a message with you, and then after the message, we're going to have a communion that we're going to share together. We have tables that are set up up here at the front, and I'll invite you to come up and receive the elements uh, as we uh, pray through that together in just a few minutes. But we're going to start uh, a brand new series today called The Return of the Elephant in the Room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Perfect, perfect. I <laughs> hear trumpets. 
Um, so we've, we've done this series before. It comes out of uh, questions or topics that have been suggested by you. I know who has suggested each topic or question. And so if I do get fired over one of them, I will come after you. <laughs> now, not with any violence, just looking for you to take care of me and my family. But, um, but we are, uh, we're here at the return of the elephant in the room. And we've got two big goals for this series Number one is we want to address some elephants that are in the room. We want to talk about some topics, issues, questions, excuse me, questions that at one time or another, thoughtful people notice that these are in the room with us whenever we gather. They are questions that occur to us, things we wonder about, questions that can create an awkward moment or an uncomfortable conversation when we bring them up with friends, especially Christian friends. So for the next four Sundays, we're going to name some elephants that are in the room. We're going to try to open up conversation about the elephant. Uh, I'm going to offer some thoughts about each of the elephants, but I'm not giving you the official word or the last word uh, or even necessarily the right word about the elephants and definitely not the last word uh, in order to end all conversation about the elephant. This is really meant to begin or to encourage or to invite dialogue or conversation among us. To say, hey, it's okay. We can talk about these things. Because the second biggest goal of this whole series is simply this. Uh, that we want to be the kind of people who get over our fear of elephants and our fears about having conversations with each other about our elephants and our fears about the consequences of having those conversations. We, we really believe that people who are living love can have challenging and awkward conversations and still love each other in the end and during and after those conversations have taken place. So the elephant in the room that we're talking about this morning is this one. What's taking God so long to finish bringing this kingdom that Jesus started? What is taking so long? Anybody ever wondered that? No, it's just three of us. All right, fair enough. Uh, here's the long form of the question. If the kingdom is coming and has been coming for 2,000 plus years, how come it doesn't seem like there's been much of a change in human behavior? Do scholars see tangible evidence or societal markers that indicate that the kingdom is indeed coming? If it's happening at an even pace, we have a really long way to go. Amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this morning, uh, that's what I want to unpack for you. And when I get to the end, right before we get to communion time, I'm going to get to the absolutely hardest thing that I'm going to say to you. I'm going to say something when, when I get to the end that for some of us, we're going to absolutely want to jump up and push back on immediately. And internally, for sure, you're going to feel this pushback rise up uh, against what I'm going to say to you. And that's okay. We can live with that tension, all right? So uh, what we're really talking about with this question, with this elephant, is the classic family road trip conundrum, which is, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Or how much longer? We, we come to anticipate the destination of where we're going to, of where we're going to get to, and... And we, uh, we tend to be affected by the challenges of our situation. My brother touched me. She looked at my side of the car. They touched my crayons. And all of those things that seem to make what might, in other cases, seem like a short trip becomes like this never-ending journey. And in the church... We tell people over and over again that there's a kingdom coming. But we've been saying that for 2,000 years. 
If you have been saying for 2,000 years that I was going to get chocolate cake for dessert, but it's been 2,000 years, the next time you tell me, I'm going to not believe you, and I'm going to start to resent you just a little bit. Because it's been 2,000 years, and I'm waiting for my chocolate cake. But in the church, we've been saying for the last 2,000 years, it's coming, coming soon. Seriously, it is. I, I promise you, it is. Just, just wait just a, a little bit longer. When, uh, when my family moved, uh, we moved our whole family from Rapid City, South Dakota, uh, to Summerside, Prince Edward Island up in Canada. And before we moved, I was the only person in our family who went and visited there. Uh, I, had to, I had to try out. They called it candidating. I had to do a little song, a little dance. I uh, had, to, had to convince them that they wanted to hire me as a youth pastor there, uh, which they did, <laughs> much to their later regret. But they did. And uh, no, 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 I'm serious. Uh, it was deeply regretted. Um, uh, and I'm okay with that. Um, but the thing is, as we drove to the island for the very first time, and it was Donna's very first time getting onto the island, and the very first time seeing with her own eyes the island, and the very first time going to the place that we were now going to call home with our two small children, we're driving along, and I, having only been there once and only arrived by airplane, every time we would come around a curve in the road, I would say, it's just around this curve. And then we'd get around the curve, and it was just another potato field. I'd say, it's this curve. It's around this curve. This looks familiar, I'm sure. Around this curve, and then we'll be there. And then we weren't there. And then another curve. It must have been six curves we went around. Finally, Donna was like, stop saying that. Just please stop saying that. Her trust that I had any idea where we were or any idea where we were going was evaporating very quickly. And sometimes it feels like we keep telling people Jesus is coming back to establish his kingdom once and for all. This time. This time. No, no, this time. No, th this time. Seriously, this, this is it. This is the year. If you've been a Christian for very long, you've seen uh, over the last uh, 40 years that, that I've been following Jesus, any number of times where people said conclusively, we know that next year Jesus is coming back and establishing the kingdom. And right now we're living in exciting times because apparently tomorrow is the latest and greatest day in which the kingdom is coming. That's in this, why, this anticipation is why we all get wound up over an eclipse. And, and Christians jump all over social media and, into, and in charismatic church services to speculate that this solar eclipse is the solar eclipse, the one to end the world as we know it. Spoilers, it's not. The book of Proverbs says, a hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. And Donna, I dashed her hopes, and she got sick of me saying, just, it's just around the next curve, when it kept not being around the next curve. And, and as people who follow Jesus, we start to, or at least some of us, start to feel like we're looking kind of silly to our friends when we keep saying, he's coming back. Especially when we know that the last generation said that, and the generation before that said it, and the generation before that said it. The kingdom coming, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven is a central theme of the gospels. It's a central motif, we say, of our story. And the gospel is known as the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's this new reality that Jesus tells us that he has launched in his coming into the world. It's a hopeful story that he brings to us. But it feels less hopeful the longer we have to ask, what is taking so long? Has anybody ever felt that? Has anybody ever felt that while I was preaching? <laughs> when, you, when you read the Gospels, 
of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find Jesus inaugurating the kingdom of God coming into the world, and he's not talking about something years from now or, or a millennium from now. He says things like, repent your, uh, of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 4, 17, from then on Jesus began to preach, repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Uh, Mark 1 says, later on after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Luke 9, 2, then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. In Luke 10, 9, heal the sick and tell them, the kingdom of God is near you now. Luke eleven twenty. 20, but if I am casting out demons by the power of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. Jesus is not saying this is something that comes to us in the sweet by and by someday. Jesus is saying very clearly throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that the kingdom has come, that I have come and inaugurated the kingdom, Jesus is saying. The kingdom has begun, and he teaches us, those who follow him, to pray, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, so we understand that from Jesus' perspective, the kingdom of God is now. It has begun. We are, we are in the unfolding, the, the revealing of the kingdom of God. And we have been there for 2,000 years. The term kingdom of God occurs four times in Matthew, 14 times in Mark, 32 times in Luke, twice in the Gospel of John, six times in Acts, eight times in Paul, and once in Revelation. Scholar and pastor N.T. Wright said this, the resurrection completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. Notice that word, completes. Completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It is the decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched on earth as it is in heaven. The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that you're now invited to belong to it. And I believe that all of that is true. But still, inquiring minds want to know. And souls starting to get heartsick are asking, when, when will it get there? Or when will it get here? And, and here's the thing. It's not a new question. This isn't the question of liberal Christians or progressive Christians. It's not even the, it's not even the question of uh, Christians in the year 2024. This question is a very, very old question. The question about the kingdom coming and, and when Jesus is coming to return and finish what he initiated started around A.D. 50. The question comes up a, a couple of times in Paul's letters to the churches he was writing to in 1 Thessalonians, his first letter to the, to the church in Thessalonica. He's, he's, he's addressing the, the issue, or at least in part one of the issues, they're asking, hey, how long is this? Like we're running out of snacks. How long until he comes back? In 1 Corinthians, he's addressing this to the Corinthians. The Corinthians are saying, look, you know, I've run up my visa bill. Do I keep paying it? What's happening? When is he coming back? And early Christians started asking people who had been around for a while, how much longer do we have to wait? How much longer is this going to take? Now, it's, it's reasonable when the boot of Rome is on your throat to say, hey, like, I signed up for this, but I thought, I thought God was going to do something, right? I, I thought he was coming back, and, and this was all getting sorted. But just 20 years after Jesus' resurrection and his return to the presence of God the Father, people were getting fidgety. Now, how many people in this room have been following Jesus for 20 years or more? That's a lot of us. Have you ever... In your 20 years, have you ever wondered, how much longer? How much longer is this going to be? And do we ever talk about that with each other? And we might whisper it to each other. But a lot of times it feels really odd. It feels like we're faithless, doesn't it? 
feels like maybe we're not, we, we don't, we're going to get zapped by God maybe for asking that question because it doesn't sound like, like we really trust him. Well, in the book of Revelation, we read this. This is Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. It says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. They shouted to the Lord and said, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people and be who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they've done to us? So right there in the throne room of heaven, John the Revelator tells us that the martyrs under the throne of God are crying out to God saying, this very thing, how long? So it's okay for you and me to ask the question. How long? How long? How long until this gets sorted out? It says, then a white robe was given to each of them and they were told to rest a little longer. Until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus who were to be martyred, <laughs> to be martyred, more to come, had joined them. So there's something that God is working out. There's something that God has planned. There's, it's not that he forgot. It's not that his alarm didn't go off. It's that he's working something out. And we don't know what that is. But, but there is a time coming. But it's not yet. So Revelation is telling, uh, is telling us that people are, are, are even asking how long in heaven. Right at the very throne of God. And being told it's just a little longer. How long was a thoroughly Jewish uh, eschatological question in the, in the uh, first century. And, and even before the first century. It's an end time question. And the question was, when is Yahweh God? When is the God of Israel going to sort out these Romans? When is God going to destroy these Romans and make Israel great again? A Jewish sect called the Essenes had moved out to form a commune in the desert in great expectation of a coming war between the sons of light, the forces of God, and the the forces of Rome, the sons of darkness, and all the worldly evil. And they were anticipating uh, this great war that was going to take place in the time of Jesus, they thought. By the time Jesus appears the first time, the Essene sect uh, was pretty sure that they were living in the last days and that the God of Israel was about to set all things right and establish his throne in Jerusalem forever and, and once and for all. And he was going to melt the faces right off the Roman like Indiana Jones melted the faces off the Nazis in the Lost Ark. But then he didn't. And the Romans kept their faces and went on to destroy Jerusalem. And so it begged the question, how long? Why are we so anxious for God's kingdom to come in its fullness anyway? Like, why is it such a big deal for us? Well, I think we're anxious. I think we feel anxious. I know I feel anxious because we've seen mankind's ability to do evil to each other, to ourselves. We have, we have witnessed what the Germans did to Jews in the Holocaust. Yeah? We have witnessed what Americans did to Asians in internment camps citizens of the United States who were of Asian descent in internment camps in World War II. We've just recently been watching what Israel has done to innocent people in Gaza, to relief workers in Gaza. We have watched with our own eyes in our own part of the world what white people have done to black people in the United States with slavery and then Jim Crow laws and segregation and lynching and things like the Tuskegee experiment and now mass incarceration. We see how people are treated who are different in some way from the dominant culture, whether it's the LGBTQ plus community or a neurodivergent community or the politically other than us group of people. 
We lament over the vast number of school shootings that occur, the mass murder of our own children, our most precious, our most vulnerable, and we do little to stop them. We see little ahead that makes us feel hopeful that it will stop. And I think we get anxious because we're worn out and we're worn down by man's inhumanity to man. Amen? We want to see the kingdom come, I think, in its fullness because we understand it's a better story. We understand that, that God has made certain promises in Jesus of what that kingdom is going to be like in its fullness. And we want it. We want it now. We want it here. We want to get it started. We believe that when the kingdom of God arrives in its fullness, that there's going to be peace and rest and enough for everyone. And there will be no more inequality and no more injustice and no more poverty or war or violence or lack. There'll be no more racism, no more sexism, no more misogyny. There'll be no more death, no more sickness. Our dead will be returned to us living. The least will be recognized as the greatest. The last will finally get to go first. Everyone will have a home. Everyone will belong. Everyone will be comfortable and safe in their own skin. So why wouldn't we want to see all that happen now, right? Well, I know if I can confess this, recognizing we're a slightly mixed audience, so I will give this a PG version that when I was in Bible college and we would regularly as Bible college students going into pastoral work we'd be discussing the end times and we'd read the passage about how uh, in the kingdom coming there was neither marriage nor giving in marriage you with me that the boys in my dorm would all pray Jesus didn't come back until we at least got married if you understand what I'm saying. We want things that we, we want to have more than we want to have the kingdom of God. But, please make sure you hear me say this. Our wants are not what's keeping the kingdom from coming in its fullness. Our wants are not what's keeping the kingdom from coming in its fullness. Jesus never would have come the first time because Jesus is definitely not what everybody wanted. Decades after Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead, decades later when the letter uh, is written that we call Second Peter, the question is a huge elephant in the room. When is this going to happen? When is the kingdom coming? It was a huge elephant in the room for the whole church. Here are some of the verses from Second Peter chapter 3 where uh, the, the, the writer of Second Peter says, most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. They'll say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. And the Lord isn't really being slow about this, his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed. He wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. But we are looking forward to the new heaven and new earth and new earth he has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. And so, dear friends, while you are waiting for these things to happen, Make every effort to be found living peaceful lives that are pure and blameless in his sight. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. So Second Peter names the elephant and then offers some explanations for those of us who are asking questions, who have been asking questions since 2,000 years ago. And he says, let's reframe it a little bit. He says, God's not slow, God is patient. 
Don't, don't think of it as God being slow. Think of it as God being patient. That, that what God is doing is taking time. And one who dwells in eternity has lots of time. And he says that God wants people to choose to follow people, not to be made to follow Jesus. And so that takes time to move people from, from what they want to wanting what they need. And then he says, make sure you know that the day is coming. Everything will be made new. Everything will be set right. It is going to happen. And so then that leads to the next question that he tries to answer. How do we live right now? How do we live in this waiting? And I think that's a pertinent question for us. How do we live in this waiting now 2,000 years later? And in Second Peter 3, he has this really curious but hopeful statement that he makes in verses 11 and 12. And it says this, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. That in some way, shape, or form, our faithfulness hurries along this day that's coming. We influence the coming of that day. But again, let me be very uh, very clear. There's there's an answer that is very popularly given to this question that is not the answer. It is not the right answer to this question. And and if you believe that it is the right answer to the question, that's fine. It's it's going to be a miserable existence for you, but and it, and it goes against everything else the scripture teaches, but if you want to hold on to it, please hold on to it. Because I understand, because, because this answer gives us control. And we love control. But here's, here's the answer that's not really the answer. You suck. But if you suck less, Jesus might come back and get this kingdom all together. Underline, this is not the right answer. Our situation is not that you suck and you just need to suck less or you aren't holy, so make yourselves holy or you're worldly, so behave better. Jesus never would have come the first time, never would have inaugurated the kingdom if it had anything to do with our good behavior about Israel finally getting it together so the Messiah would come. If we could make ourselves holy, Jesus wouldn't even have had to come the first time. He would have just sent a note that said, work it out. See you when you get there. But we inhabit a better story, a truer story, that we now live in a time and a place where we get to live the kingdom now um, the best we can because it's where we want to live. That we have become absolutely uh, enraptured with the ideas that Jesus said, that this is the way, walk in this way. And we say, yes, that's the kind of person I want to be. That's the kind of family I want to have. That's the kind of community I want to be a part of. That's the kind of kingdom for me. And I will live or die to be that kingdom on the earth. It's an opportunity now for us to show each other and the world around us how good the kingdom coming is by giving each other a taste of that kingdom coming now. It's an opportunity for us to increase the hope we have by living the kingdom in our right here and our right now by the grace of God so that people in our lives will look and be able to say, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I want whatever you've got. Someone uh, way smarter than me has written this. As followers of Jesus who believe the eschatological promises, the end time promises have broken into the present through the work of Jesus and the outpouring of the spirit. We don't wait idly for Jesus' return, nor do we live like the corrupt teachers who saw Jesus' delay as an opportunity to indulge the flesh. Rather, like Peter, we live as new, transformed humans who take advantage of the divine delay to join in God's redemptive purposes. We live out our days bearing witness to Jesus, continuing his mission, fighting back the powers of darkness, and hastening the day when those purposes will be full accomplished so yes we wait 
but we wait patiently knowing that God is orchestrating all of human history toward his glorious end and we wait purposefully joining in God's redemptive mission to make disciples of all people. That's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we've been invited into. Now I want to end. I want to land the plane. But, but in landing the plane, I want to tell you some things that you're not going to like. I'm going to tell you some things that, that inside of you, you're going to say that's not true. But I promise you that you can go to the great Googler and you can research this. Even while you're sitting in your seat, if you have a smartphone, you can invoke the oracle of the Googler and you can ask the Googler, hey, is this true? Is this guy lying about this? And the Googler will impart this information to you. That's how confident I am in the truthfulness of this. But I know you and I, especially as Christians living in North America right now, living in the United States right now, we are being constantly bombarded with an opposite narrative to what I'm about to tell you. You have been informed of the opposite of what I'm about to say to you. So I, I understand the resistance, and it's okay. Don't, don't, try to, don't try to reconcile the resistance while I'm sharing this. Just, just, just let it wash over you. Try to take in what you can. So using uncontroversial data taken from official and scientific sources such as the United Nations, World Health Organization, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and World Bank, we see that on most measures, the world is actually improving, and it's improving at an accelerated rate. Globally, e incomes are growing. Prior to COVID-19, uh, the median U.S. income was at an all-time high, and absolute poverty in the world is declining. We live longer lives with more mothers surviving pregnancies and more babies living into an adulthood. Ooh, can you feel that, that tension? Because you know this isn't the story you've been told. Humanity has access today to more food and education, cleaner water, and safer sanitation than ever before in history. Homicide rates have fallen from their highs in most places, though that trend has been partly reversed recently. We fight fewer wars, and the wars that we do fight are shorter and cost fewer lives. The male-female gap in education and income is rapidly closing. Other positive trends include the rise in global happiness, decline in global income inequality, falling uh, share of the world's population living in slums, political empowerment of women, rise in IQ scores, decriminalization of same-sex relationships, continued rise in vaccinations against contagious diseases, falling cancer death rates, decline in the use of capital punishment, falling rates of military spending and conscription, again, partly reversed in recent years, the shrinkage of nuclear arsenals, a decline in working hours that leaves more time for leisure, falling rates of child labor and workplace accidents, increasing access to electricity, and internet-driven access to information. Can you believe those things are true? Sometimes we're so focused on a moment and so focused on a particularity that we miss what God is doing is on a global scale. And what the statistics, what the information, the data seems to be indicating is that in fact the kingdom coming may be a slow train coming, but it's coming. And we're getting nearer and nearer and nearer a destination. Maybe, and this is just me speculating, but maybe 
it's this, that God is just never going to force the kingdom on anybody. Because love just doesn't do that. Because love forced feels like hell to the person upon whom it's forced. So maybe that's just not what God is up to. Maybe God is not going to force the kingdom on anybody. Maybe the kingdom just sneaks up on us like a thief in the night. Maybe God is taking the time that it takes to convince you and me and everybody else who's alive that we want a kingdom shaped like Jesus instead of a kingdom shaped like the world we've been in. Maybe evil is that proverbial frog in the pot. And little by little, the kingdom temperature is being turned up by us living out the kingdom life until it comes fully and we finally boiled evil right out of our existence. Is that possible? Is that a thing that could happen? Here's what I know for sure. God's kingdom will come. God's will will be done on earth, just as in heaven. The train is coming, and the train won't be stopped. And it seems like it's a long time coming, and it's okay for us to talk about how long it feels like it's coming. But we, we need to make sure we don't miss out on there's something for us to be busy about while we're waiting. And now I want to share a communion uh, together. Uh, we've got uh, these tables that are set up on either side. We've got a brand new uh, litany for this season that we're in uh, to pray through as we come to communion. So I'll invite you to pray the words that are in yellow with me. I'll pray the words that are in white. If everything works the way that it's supposed to, then I'll invite you to come up and to uh, receive the cup uh, from the tray. Uh, there's uh, bread in the bottom. There's juice in the top. Uh, the, the bread to remind us of the body of Christ, the juice to remind us of the blood of Christ, uh, and we will pray through this together. So, uh, let's begin. The Holy One be with you. Open your hearts. Let us give thanks to God for God's faithful presence. Faithful one, we come to your table hungry for a taste of your kingdom. In a world where evil and empire come together to hoard and exploit, we crave the fruits of your spirit. We long for kindness. We dream of peace. We hope to be disciples of generosity, sharing and redistributing the resources you intended for the flourishing of all. Gathering at your table, we remember the ordinary gifts of heaven among us. Those that nurture hope when it's hard to find. That surprise us in destruction's wake. That bring new life from sights of death. And sustain our labors of love across generations. Since the beginning you have been growing a people of love and liberation. Inviting all who wish to belong. Through the saints and prophets you call us to turn for the temptation of power and individualism to deepen our commitments to building communities of care and justice, and to practice the radical hospitality of God so that none must struggle alone. You have shown us the way, taken on flesh, and dwelled among us. In Jesus, God came to us in the flesh, born without access to wealth or power, his life is a witness to hope that does not come from climbing ladders of power or begging for crumbs of dignity. Hope that is born in community, nurturing love, taking risks together, multiplying what we have, and finding it is more than enough. Jesus shared a meal with his companions, his community, his chosen family before he would be arrested. Filled with love for them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this, remembrance of me. 
After the meal, he took the cup, blessed it, and shared it, saying, This cup that is poured out is the new covenant. In remembrance of Jesus, executed by the state, faithful to the end, we pro proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ was birthed among us. Christ was killed among us. Christ rises again among us. Gracious one, may your spirit be poured out upon these elements. May this bread and this cup be for us a revival of hope and a renewal of courage as we encounter your presence among the ordinary gifts of life. Through the grace of your sustenance, may Christ be with us. When you're ready, just invite you to come up uh, to the table on either side, receive the cup uh, from there with the bread and the juice, make your way back to your seats, and then when we're all back to our seats, we'll receive together. So we receive now this bread that reminds us of the body of Christ that has been crucified for us so that we can be free. Now we receive this cup that reminds us of the blood of Christ that we shed for us, that we could be liberated and we could be set free. Now I ask you to pray this prayer with me. Faithful God, though you have been betrayed many times, you still do not give up on love. Evil is relentless, but so too is your belief in us, in our ability to be transformed, to turn from dominance, to mend and repair where harm has been done. May we, too, believe in our potential for co-creating with you a future flourishing for all life. We give thanks for this meal, a reminder of your unending grace and abiding companionship. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you would, just invite you to stand with me now. We're going to sing our benediction. If there's anything that's going on in your life right now, anything you need prayer for, any place you need God to show up and do something miraculous, uh, we have uh, people who'd be happy to pray with you, who believe God shows up and does miraculous things. And so we just invite you to come up and get some prayer. There'll be people over by the door that'll meet you by those doors over there or over by the little window over here that will pray with you. 
And, uh, and if you start down there, uh, you'll find them waiting for you uh, and be able to pray with you about anything you might be going through. Um, but, uh, but then we'll sing this song as our, uh, our benediction and then uh, hang around as long as you like, shake some hands, meet some new friends, uh, get to know some.